Hi everyone, you're listening to the Via Lucci podcast, uncensored and completely unedited discussions about life and everything in it. We hope you enjoy the show. And we're live. Are we, Will? Yeah, okay, that's yes, lovely. Okay, brilliant. Leslie, Udwin, the surname, Udwin. I like it when I've never heard a surname before. Is there any sort of what that may, anywhere that come from? Udwin. Well, like many other surnames, it's not the original surname. It's oh, been yeah. changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe it was originally Udevina. Right, of course. Right. Um, yeah. My father's forefathers came from Lithuania. Yeah. And Devina is a river in Lithuania and U means a cross. So these were people who lived across the river that's Divina. That's great, isn't it? That's, that's fantastic, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this, you, oh, I... the best, the best I've ever heard of a name change is Michael Bogdanovich, a director who I worked with at the National Theatre yeah. in my previous incarnation. Um, his original name was Michael Bogdan. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny when you translate things into, into um, well, Western language, it's sort of it becomes quite crude and harsh and they just cut off the sounds and the thing that it, it just sounds like a noise that comes out. Yeah, I'll never forget. Not what, everything translates directly. That's why. Yeah. I, I was listening to, um, oh, they, it was, it was a, oh, it was a BBC thing. It was ages ago. Um, and it was about the bag of a anyway, but they got onto, um, the, uh, what was the guy Oppenheimer? You know, they were saying they were talking about, translating things from how people have translated things into the western culture and there was a guy there that an indian fella and he said um he said yeah he said when you translate i hear people translate it into english things and they've completely lost the meaning it's always like crude blows and he said so the oppenheimer quote about um um but he, he ref- references as the battle in the back of my guitar and the quote is um as oppenheimer says it he says, oh, Sanskrit, that's it. He, he copied it from Sanskrit. He said, um, uh, I am death, you know, destroyer, destroyer of worlds. worlds. Yeah. Oh, yes. So this guy, who was obviously a scholar in this in Sanskrit, he said, he said, it's, it, it wasn't that. It said the, the Westerners, they translate things to be very blocky. And he said, what he actually says in Amongst the Battle, he said, it's not I am a death destroyer of worlds. He said, um, uh, I am time and everything destroys like mm, time very different but the translation to western culture i am death destroyer yes. of worlds yes and death means d- different things yeah. well different, time he you know. said we're all dead that's what he's saying in the battle yeah. we're all dead so you might as well die gracefully not a destroyer of worlds very <laughs> sort of like marvel universe translation and turning a great world insight <laughs> into a threat no nuance yeah <laughs> Um, oh God! Right, hang on. What were we talking about? So yeah, uh, yeah so I like that the, the surname thing. That's great. Um, uh, well, the main okay. I'm going to bring it out of this, but we, I want to tend to it. I don't want to end on this, so I want to get to the start. So, how would you describe yourself? A documentary filmmaker? No, I mean, acting. No, no. After I'm everything? a former filmmaker. Oh, a former actor. Well, right. oh, so now okay, yeah, okay. So you're moving on to the fixing the things that you've. Hundred percent. Right, so okay. I'm an activist. For the think equal. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. It's all I do. It's yeah. all I will ever do. Right. It's what I do with every That's breath the, I take, right, and okay. I will be doing with my last breath. Right. I so I saw the documentary years ago. I still can't believe I'm meeting you because it was such a profound thing for me. I'm trying the to India's do, daughter one. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. trying to do some things about change society, but you've got to do it in the way. That, I've always said, like Oscar Wilde said, you have to change society with the weapons of its own ear, right? So it's sort of you've got to Lovely. do things in the right way. Well, bless you for doing that. Can no, I just say thank you for doing that? Yeah, it's, it's there a long... There is so much apathy. Yeah. And thank heavens you're doing it. Thank you. Yeah. I... It's it's difficult to fight, to, to, yeah. to, to maintain that spark, yeah. because it can be so overwhelming. Yeah. I mean, like, just as I said, watching the news yesterday, yeah. will look... Yeah. Yeah. Nonsense over the protests and this and that. And, Can um, I tell you, honestly, from my heart, I wake up every single day knowing if I just keep my eye on the children and the business at heart yeah. and at hand, yeah. we will be okay. Yeah. And I know it's working. I see this working yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah. I get reports in from the thousands and thousands of classrooms we're in where children are transforming miraculously, yeah. 
utterly inexpensively and with enormous purpose. And I see it happening and I know we're going to be okay. Yeah. And it's the most rewarding job I have. Yeah, I feel like it's slightly turned. It's not as hard now. I think there's a, there's a wisdom that's hard. now, there was a weird 20 years and I think we're slowly coming out of things. And your documentary, when it led to the mass protests in India, so can you just describe it quickly about what it was in your words? Yes. So actually it was the other way around. First were the mass protests um, and then, Before Jotty Singh. So the protests were about the gang rape yeah, of Jotty yeah, Singh. Yeah. And indeed, they started before she'd even died. She died 13 days after this gang rape, right. which was so brutal yeah, that there yeah. was no way she could have survived. Yeah, the yeah. surgeons actually said, we don't Can't know which so parts yeah. of her to join. Yeah. Um, I was living in Denmark at the time, and I saw this news on television as we all did, and choked on our breakfast. Yeah. Um, the very day after the rape, the rape was on the 16th of December, and on the 17th, students at Javadlan Nehru University in Delhi started coming out onto the streets, and these protests grew and grew. They were the most phenomenal yeah, yeah. protests ever. I had never in my life seen yeah. any country in the world yeah. stand Let alone up, there. Yeah. Let alone there. Um, stand up with so much courage and so much vigor and yeah. passion for ending violence against women. They basically were saying, enough's enough. We're not having this anymore. Yeah. And the government was so terrified yeah. Yeah. because they saw numbers on those streets yeah. of millions of men and women. It was partition all over again. They had never seen such protests yeah. since 1947. Yeah. They were terrified. Yeah. So they brought out all of the might of the state to repress these protests, right? Um, the water cannons and guns. It was like warfare, actually. Mm. But these protesters went on for a month and a half. A month and a half. Yeah. And I fell hopelessly in love with them. And yeah. I just thought, oh, my God, this is literally the beginning of the end of violence against women. This is the seminal historical moment that yeah. we will all look back to yeah. and say that's when yeah. GBV, yeah. you know, ended or <clears throat> the beginning of the end. And so I basically gathered my little family around, my two young children then, um, and begged them for permission to leave them for two years to go in, to India and make this yeah. documentary. Um, and that's what took me there. It wasn't actually the rape and right, the darkness right, yeah. of that event. It was the light that yeah. issued forth from that darkness. Yeah. I know? remember the protest because I wasn't, I didn't have TV or anything, but it got through to me. Like it still found me, you know, that yes. sort of way. It just well, and I thought, I thought it was a, th they'd do it and then it would be gone the next day. And I was thinking, oh, it's strange that that's different. That's, it's still there. That's exactly and what I felt. And in a yeah. country, it's yeah. not like us, you know, we, after we've had our coffee, we can go and protest and cope a couple of days off work. Yeah. That's in an impoverished country, which I think people forget yeah. that to do that, it, it takes people have an stuff enormous to do. amount. Yeah. Yes. Um, but so, so can you just explain the documentary briefly before yes. I go into what it so, so I went there in the wake of these yeah. magnificent protests thinking, and this is what I'd filled my head with, I am going to make a film, a documentary that amplifies the voices of the protesters. Those yeah. were the words I had lodged in my head, yeah. my pitch. And when I got there, I felt absolutely vapid and stupid. Yeah. I thought, what the hell does that mean? What kind of jargon, empty, yeah. empty words are these? If I follow the logic of that through, what am I going to do? I'm going to create a campaigning film. Yeah. A campaigning film that does what? Creates awareness. Do we really need any more awareness yeah. about violence yeah. uh, and, and particularly violence against women? And yeah. I just thought this is bullshit, frankly, yeah. if you don't mind my saying so. Um, what I need to do is sit in front of those men mm. who performed that brutal, violent act yeah. on that bus and, and look into their eyes and find out who are they? What kind of human beings do this to, yeah. to another human being? Because if we don't understand them, yeah. how in God's name are we ever going to change them? Mm. And quite frankly, we don't want to understand them, do yeah. we? We want to push them away and say, you are nothing to do with me. Yeah. Let's hang you. Let's imprison you for X number of years. It matters not. It's not changing a jot yeah. when we do that. Because what I learned 
through interviewing these men, because I did. I yeah, got permission yeah. and I sat in prison cells and interviewed them and other rapists and murderers for 31 hours over many, many weeks. And believe me, the insights yeah. live with me every second of every day. And they yeah, were so clear. That, that was that, that was for me. I mean, it's it's a heartbreaking story. It really, it really is. I mean, it, it, yeah, it, I found it very moving. But the, the shocking bits I found, I mean, obviously the, what happened to that poor woman was very shocking, but... The unrepentance, yes. uh, and that that's that's what I found shocking yes. is that these people was were, were there, uh, that chap, um, you know, he'd been sentenced to, to be to be hanged, um, and he was still like, well, you know, and he was still n not a modicum of self reflection yeah. or, or analysis, so or, right. or, or, and it was, yeah. and therein lies a massive perception and a huge insight that I then carried forward into my detective like logic. If this is true then this must be true, ah, then it means. And that is how I worked through yeah. the insights. Because the insight from that is, why are they not regretting? The Nazi commandants in, you know, there was this beautiful book by Gita Sereni called Into That Darkness, where she interviewed a Nazi commandant of a camp that had been responsible for, I, I, I don't know, hundreds of thousands perhaps mm -hmm. of, of deaths. Not a second of regret, not even repentance, <laughs> not even yeah. regret, yeah. right? And it was the same with these men. Why, we have to ask ourselves, are they not repentant? The truth, we may not like it, but this is the truth. They do not believe they've done wrong. These are robots. These are human beings who have been programmed by who? By us by society, by sociocultural thinking. They've been taught since the minute they've opened their eyes in the world, a girl is subject to different regulations and rules. Yeah. If a girl is out at night after dark, fair game. And they said worse than being out at night after dark, this slut, as they told me, was with her boyfriend. He wasn't her husband. <laughs> he wasn't her father. He wasn't her brother. This girl, and this is word for word what they told me, she not only deserved what she got, we had a duty to teach her a lesson. Yeah. And to him, to know that he means it. He means it. not acting. That, that's and of in course his soul. he means it. Yeah. And we've told him he's yeah. right to mean it. He didn't even say, they didn't even seem sorry for themselves. You know, that, yeah. that, that there no. wasn't even a sort of like... Yeah realization that oh if i hadn't have done this then i wouldn't be about to be executed yeah. by the state so you yes. know what i mean it, there, there wasn't the even that is, kind of but awareness. even even their culture plays a role because actually death in india means a very very different thing <laughs> to death for us okay? in what way well because you are reincarnated <clears throat> oh, okay, and you know yeah. it's a kind of fact death is a fact it's going to happen at some point and okay it's happening to me this way there isn't that urgency about my life's about to end yeah. I, I don't know i mean that's you know it's a but, but there's subtle a, point and maybe not that but important a, but no, I, I completely agree there is a cultural bit because it, it isn't because there is life there is death and then there is rebirth there is a third part that's right and we don't necessarily think about the third yeah. part we sort of have a life and then you die and then uh, well yes. maybe you go to heaven maybe you don't whatever maybe there's something else but there is another chapter and yes. it is it yeah, is a they, cycle isn't there a, you know? isn't there's, there's there's dharma there's karma dharma and there's the the last one there's about Tell. five yeah is Dharma? I don't know. I don't know enough. Look, don't know. none of us. Karma is the yes. comes around. Yeah, Dharma yes. means only way. Yeah. But so, look, there's one more. Um, <clears throat> what, what, there was one more interview that perhaps says it more clearly in terms of this, this point that I got so powerfully that they'd been taught to think as they think. And when you're taught to think a certain way, of course, action proceeds from thought, right? And attitude. So there was one of the rapists I interviewed. His name was Gorov. He was not on the bus. I had to practice because I'd been raped at 18 in South Africa. So many of us are, right? One in five of us. I saw those statistics, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I had to practice before I interviewed these men because I was terrified that I would leap out of my chair yeah, and yeah. throttle one yeah. of them. And I thought, oh, my God, this is the perfect storm, yeah. you know. In my day, you didn't tell anyone you were raped because the finger would be pointed straight yeah, at you. Right. Why Why did you trust him? Yeah. What were you doing? Did yeah. you know him well enough? 
all this yeah. went on, you know. So I just told nobody, didn't tell my best friend even, no one. And I thought, oh, my God, I've suppressed this for 20 years. And now I'm sitting here in front of these men. It's all going to leap up. And, um, and I'm going to lose my film. You know, as a producer, director, all you think about is your film. <laughs> and I, I'm going to lose it because they then will refuse to talk to me after I hit yeah. one of them. So I asked for permission to practice. Gorov was one of the rapists I practiced on. And he had raped a five-year-old girl. And I sat with him and spoke to him for three hours. At the end of which I said, Gaurav, I beg you, help me understand something. Please yeah. tell me what goes on in your brain yeah. from the moment you're standing there. I know what you're thinking, what you want to do. But now you're looking at this, this fragile little girl and you've described her so well. I can see her, you know, how do you go from and this guy just looks at me like, you know, God, who is this idiot they've brought to interview me, right? And he says, word for word, he says this, looking at me with utter derision. She was a beggar girl. Her life was of no value. Yeah. Word for word. Yeah. What is that? That's gender? More than gender. It's caste. Yeah. She was a fly to be swatted away, a cockroach to be stamped on. She was nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's not programming, what is? Yeah. So you see, we program our children yeah. and whichever part of the world we're in, we're doing the same thing. Yeah. These, these have been patriarchal societies since time immemorial. We program our children with these attitudes and then we try and distance ourselves from the perpetrators yeah. who simply follow our instructions. Yeah. This is the insanity of the, it. The documentary, when I had seen it, 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 it felt what was coming into my head, it was like, and it sounds cliche to say, but it's as if you'd got in a time machine and gone back somewhere and then said, look, this still exists. Like, this is what it used to be. And, you know, no, even though it's modern times. Because obviously, the, the, like you speak to the, their defense lawyer. I was thinking this, like those are the, the, you know, when they speak to the rapist and they just, that it's scary. I was almost thinking, outside of poor Jotley's life, the the, the horror of the 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 the, 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 the uh, defense person for them and them was as important to hear as her losing her life, because without them saying those things, it may have just been another. So I think they sort of accidentally were a massive part of the change than just her losing her life. That thank you for saying what you just said. In, and then because that shows the, us such an and insight. for the prosecutor to then give you those words on top of that. Mm. Because when I when listen, he said if she were my daughter, yeah, I would take her home yeah. to my farmhouse, yeah. and in front of my whole family, yeah. I would pour petrol on her and burn her alive. And this is the highest le level of education now. Thank you. Yeah. That's the point, yeah, you see, because yeah. that was the biggest insight I got. Yeah, this isn't poverty speaking. This isn't poor person. This isn't no. sick people. This is the no. culture you're hearing. Both ends of the culture are saying the same thing. That's right. Yeah. And the other critically important thing is that as I sat in those prison cells, having to understand who these rapists were, because yeah. that was my endeavor. And as I sat there, Mandela's words kept on coming and crashing on my yeah. brain like a wave, you know, on a shore. And his words were, education is the most powerful weapon we have to change the world. Right. Now, why am I thinking this? Because all these rapists were uneducated. Yeah. One only had finished secondary school. But then I meet the lawyers yeah. and I think, wait a minute. Yeah. And that's why I say it was like a detective yeah. journey for yeah. me because I thought, the lawyers are the most highly educated you can get in yeah. India. So what the hell was Mandela talking about? Yeah. It can't be true what he was saying. Or the alternative is that he meant a different kind of education, not this education that we're peddling to our children, which is all about this conveyor belt yeah. from the classroom to the labor market. This industrial revolution yeah. model of education, which is simply not fit for purpose. Yeah. And we are failing our children. We are neglecting our children, yeah. all of us. The parents, the policymakers, the leaders are neglecting 
our children yeah. because we are only teaching them in these foundational years numeracy and literacy. Yeah. And we're missing out on probably the most important thing they need to learn. How do I regulate my emotions? Yeah. How do I view other human beings? Yeah. Do I view another human being, that little girl yeah. who Gaurav was standing in front of, as absolutely equal, no matter what her economic background or caste, so-called, yeah. is, or color or religion or gender? So you see, this is what I discovered in those prison cells, is that what we are dealing with here as the disease of our world, what is raging now in Gaza, what is raging in Ukraine, what we are dealing with isn't the violence as the disease. That's the symptom yeah, of the disease. Yeah. The disease itself is the mindset that accords lesser or no value to another human being on whatever basis, is the discriminatory mindset. And unless we tackle that, we go nowhere. We go around in circles. Mm. And the thing about Mandela is that I, realizing that he couldn't possibly have meant the kind of education those lawyers had or the kind of education we are giving our children all over the world, mm. I searched for what he meant. How did he define oh. education? And I found it. Yeah. What is it? No child, he said, is born hating another human being on the basis of the color of their skin, their religion, gender, or any other factor. A child has to be taught to hate. Yeah, I was going to, my, my grandfather always quoted the uh, musical South Pacific. There is a song in that and it says, you must be uh, carefully taught to hate. And it's a similar thing. He said, go. and he would quote there that. He said that again. He always used to say, "No one's born with this. No one's yeah. born, you know, no. with this intrinsic thing of, of, of you know division and seeking, you know, to that people less than them. It's it, you have to be taught. Correct, yeah. and that is socio-cultural conditioning. That is the programming. I saw every single one of those men I interviewed had the identical answers. Actually, yeah, may have used slightly different words here and there, but almost, almost not yeah. same narrative. Because that is society programming you to think a certain way. And just as Mandela said, you can be taught to hate, he also finishes his quote saying, if you can be taught to hate, you can be taught to love. Yeah. And that is when, for me, the fireworks went off. I decided never again in my life will I make another film. They can only create awareness. Yeah. What we need now is that change that actually teaches our children to love, that teaches the next generation to love. Because sadly, I then found out Neuroscience is very clear. If you want to teach somebody something that is going to be reflexive and fundamental to the way they live their lives, it has to be before the age of six. Yeah. Before the age of six. Now, of course, people will change after six. It doesn't mean no one will ever change again after six. But 90% of the adult brain is fully formed by the age of five. Right. Neuroscientific fact. And... Certain trajectories in the brain in terms of neuropathways that have been laid and then subsist into adulthood, emotion regulation, habitual ways of responding, pretty much flat line at six. You need to come in with an army of psychologists yeah. and you better have trillions of dollars, right, to change that. Yeah, so, I was, the, 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 I've been saying this the, almost ad nauseum, even in my 30s, where I said the schooling system in my head is just Victorian era. It's it's, it's almost cruel. It is. So because how many, because I thought to myself, I got through school. I got through schooling without them knowing I couldn't read. Then I went on to do all these other things. But my GCSEs, like I put a magazine together, weekly podcast, script writing, had no experience, never done it before. But I got U's and G's at school. And I still think about that now that, how did I, now I wasn't manipulating the system. I learned ways of le not letting them know that I wasn't mm -hmm. reading and mm -hmm. getting other people to do work for me. And the family thing, the schooling and the family should either, one can fail when the other one will pick up because I'd both had failed. But somehow got through and thinking, I didn't know I was dyslexic, like severe dyslexia. I thought it wasn't my, I wasn't supposed to figure that out. Somebody was supposed to figure that out for me. So how did I come through that? Then realize I couldn't read and learn to read at 30 on my own. Wow. And then look back and go, Wow. How did you, none of you, all these professionals, yes, pick it I up? I got or through the system. Bother, exactly. So when you look at like 80% uh, illiteracy rate in um, prisons, 
He could, but nobody says that. Why are yes. we all these people here? Because they, I, I say, if you're at school and you don't know how to read, or you might have a learning disability, you better have good parenting. Because if you haven't got that parenting to go, why is he not learning? Then you're going to end up where you might end up as a CEO, or you're more likely to end up as a jail because you go to mm-hmm. the group that are most like you. And if you can't read, of course. you don't go towards. Pe- so, like when I say about um, the worst thing is if you get through not reading is you learn to put things in place where you don't need to read. And that just makes it 10 times worse. So you're around people that can't read. You do jobs where you don't need to read. And it gets worse and worse and worse. But I knew, I remember sitting in a room, uh, like a shared accommodation place when I was younger, and just going, oh, right, none of us in here read. Because when I was trying to learn to read, they were taking the mic. Interesting, like it was yeah. in the, They were taking the mic that I was trying to learn. Like that, they're not being ironic. They go, oh, they should, oh, look at Shakespeare, because I was copying out the dictionary to try and learn to read. Wow. And, um, but that now looking back, I go, they weren't being funny. It was like a bit weird that you were learning to read. Yes, and it was threatening to them. They yes. didn't want you so to. So I would think about yeah. the education system, and I think now, it's like I can't even be bothered to talk about it the way it is now. Mm. It's beyond talk. It's Victorian. So if you went back and thought of all the people from, you know, 100 years ago that maybe they had learned disabilities and go, what happened to all those billions of people? Where did they go? It was, well, you either fit into this system or good luck and you better have a yes. family with some money they behind. they throw you out. Or you end up in jail or whatever. But um, the ignorance. So, and I thought that was the low level. But then when I saw your documentary, I thought, oh God, there's a whole other level. Like I said, going back in yeah. a time machine of like, no, that's there now. And Well, well it's, it, you know, it's fueled by ex- extreme poverty. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it really just, you know, when you see people with, Nothing. I mean, yeah. not even some people don't even have clothes. Yeah. <laughs> they are that poor. Yeah. It is really shocking. I mean, I, I spend like five, five months traveling around India as a, as a young man, yeah. and um, and yes, it was a formative experience for me. It's certainly, um, uh, you know, having grown up in uh, leafy Berkshire, <laughs> it was. Um, it certainly uh, sort of you know shook me yeah. um, awake. And um, but you're not making any assumption. I hope that the uh, brutality. And the crimes and the are in any way linked to poverty, because they're not. No, no, no. I mean, you have the look at Donald Trump for God's sake, <laughs> right? No, there is every yeah. child needs the missing subject, as we call it at Think Equal, the missing third dimension to education, and we call it social and emotional learning for well-being psychosocial support, because that is now critically needed, particularly post-COVID, and social justice. If you do not teach children empathy, equality, gender equality, racial equality, environmental stewardship, emotional literacy, emotion regulation, where are they meant to learn all this? You have to teach it to them. And they sure as hell aren't learning it from their parents, I can tell you that. Yeah. Uh, apart from anything, the parents don't have time anymore yeah. to parent their children. Their heads are too involved in screens and phones and, you know. Jobs. Um, yeah. And jobs. Yeah. And and the lie that life is about accumulation of wealth. Well, you, I, mean, I, I remember the, the, um, I was seeing something on TV. It was just a random thing. And it was a documentary and the kid was in bed and they were filming them at night time and the phone went off and he picked the phone up and he started talking to his friend. And I think in my, just my pattern recognition, I just suddenly realized that, that before you had a guardian, a parent that filtered the outside world out to the child. And then the phone came in into the kid's bedroom and said, no, look, we're going to give you the outside world straight to you. Straight to you. And it was just the fact that and I, mm. I just thought... Well, it's a, it was a big no, deal if you had a remember, TV in your room. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, right. like, because uh, you know, your parents didn't know what you were watching, and you could end up watching horror. But movies if you wanted to phone night, a friend you know? or a girlfriend, well, yeah. you had to go through the parent. You had to mm-hmm. phone the. And I thought they removed that and given mm-hmm. the, the horrors of the world yes. straight to a child, including a pornography and I mean, all sorts of violence, everything. Yeah. And I just remember thinking, what we can't, we're not the human being isn't ready for that. The child being given. The keys to the world. Adults yeah. aren't, don't seem to be yeah, ready exactly, for it either. Yeah. People no. come up with all types. People come up yeah. with all types of weird explanations and mm. uh, all types of bizarre theories that they're picking out the air because they seem interesting. Yeah. I mean, this isn't just. You know, I mean, I would say I'm, I'm glad I'm not a kid growing up now because it looks 
scary like with, with all this you know mm. all the, the social media and stuff and everything i i i am glad that i grew up in a in a in a simpler time yeah. <laughs> so. and yet we can do something about that and we are doing something but let me give you hope you want a bit of hope? no no yes, i, I yes. want to get to the hope but i want to finish <laughs> the documentary because it meant okay. so much to me i'm not okay. i don't randomly say i never thought i'd get to meet you i was so glad when i thought oh you're somebody who did that is here because when i saw that documentary it's what are you i've been using the, i kept saying to people it was the worst until you told me no the worst is the wrong it was the most horrendous thing i'd ever seen mm -hmm. i didn't stop crying the whole time no. mm. and i was more like a bit of an animal myself i was just it just it was when i started to change my life um and i, I just this is a personal thing i just wanted to say these things because things don't get said and i just want to get because I, I, I people that changed my life two died and i didn't get a chance to say thank you then you grow up and you go oh no i didn't so i just make sure i say stuff to people so i just want to say i haven't even really thought about it but just what happened so i saw it um i come from a bad world anyway with yeah. things you know you don't even talk about things that go on even in the western culture um and i saw that and i remember it was multiple th again to my pattern recognition how i see the world as a dyslexic you know everything's images it was it had it was accidentally had everything in it it was one of those things that had everything in it one was as i said it had the apps the, the the mindset of the absolute impoverished and the rich so you couldn't blame anything yes. you had to hear those yes. accidentally then it was uh jot to yourself when a best i remember so i saw this probably eight years ago i can't watch it again i can't i tried to do it i can't I, but it's enough was in my head that's carried i've carried it through mm -hmm. with me um was when it was the fact that she was studying medicine, you know, in the family. That was mm. the first person mm. that was supposed to do something. I remember the, the 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 friend talking about how somebody grabbed her purse or something. Yes. She ran off and the copper grabbed oh. him and went to beat him. And she went to stop him. Correct. And that stuck. So it was the, the kindness of her. The fact the yeah. best friend was still around to talk about it. Yeah. The absolute horror. Then the getting those people to say what they said at each end of the i just thought that accidentally happened all those things mm. and it just stuck with me so when i've i was gonna keep going about what i'm doing but the, all the horror of everything i've been trying to do the long way round so that it means something having seen that i still think about her um as probably one of the five most important people in my life two of them Amazing. on my hand malcolm x and oscar wilde but i honestly go through my head from back then at least every two weeks i think so when i'm tired and i'm bored and i can't think i think Judy. i hope somewhere she knows that i've taken something and that mm -hmm. Uh, and it's what her father says at the end of the film isn't it oh good. i didn't even want to bring that up it sounds yeah. so cliche yeah but, but it's when, true. when she said when she apologizes to the mum. Oh my oh god, god, that's that, I, that's when I can't watch it again. That's oh, it, I'm done. Yeah. I can't I, that kick yeah. my legs away. Whatever. Up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, think about it. So, yeah. um, I'm, it's heartbreaking. I mean, it really was. Mm. Yeah. And when the doctor's oh. saying, we said, we can't mm. fix what they did to her. I can still see his face. Yeah. But I just wanted to say that because I have to say stuff that what you did, that my life is part of that what Amazing. you did well, all those I mean, things that were accidentally but the horror in it the worst things are the things that needed to happen 100 percent. the horror 100 the, the, the rapist and that that lawyer, lawyer. gave you without them accidentally they yeah. gave you that yeah. without them they would the, be no the, think equal the protest would be that yeah yeah my thing god knows what have happened to me out of the outside of a few people but i just want to say to you that i don't want to say thank you but my life changed and still does because of that and because of her life. I want to know she's up there going, when you were lazy and you couldn't be bothered, remember what happened to me. Yes. And I'm young. I didn't have a life. Yes. So whatever you're going through, get on with it to make that death worth something. So I've said that. And I never thought I'd get I'm to so speak. I'm so glad you did. I'm so glad you did. Yeah. So that I just wanted to say my piece, but everyone should see that it's, um, I, again, I hate saying cliche things, but I think it's the most important documentary of my lifetime and will be seen more. Every 10 years, that needs to be brought out again. That mm -hmm. brought out again and just rammed down people's throats. Podcast on it, ram it down people's throats. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the stuff that's said, um, I'd heard, not in jest, 
but from people I know in this country about not being out overnight, they still know they're not really supposed to. They do it, mm. but they know that it's somewhere in their parenting, the first oh, yeah. generations. They oh, still yeah. say I, it. I hear, over I hear this, from, yeah. I, this, from, I, this yeah. from women. You know, they yeah. say, well, you know, she shouldn't have gone up to I his hope, hotel room. Yeah. And uh, what was she thinking? And I'm like, well, <laughs> I I know, well we shouldn't, he shouldn't have raped her. I Sorry, hope I every yeah. generation, it, it, it's going to get rid of itself a little bit. But that's not enough. Anymore. No, no, no. And it's not going to. No. It's not going to. Because it is cyclical. It's generational, attitudinal thinking. Yeah. You cannot. You have to disrupt that. Yeah. Absolutely, um, you know, positively. You have to get in there and change this. Right. Outside of the family. Yeah. And the only place you can change it, and the only time you can change it, is between three and six. Yeah. So that's what it was. Everyone needs to see it, and it should... I'll, I'll tell everyone about it, and it needs to come out again and again and again, but it's one of the most important things as Indian daughter. You've got to watch this thing. Jotty Singh's her name. So moving forward, mm. and this is the thing that scares me, because I just think there has to be something to do. We need to know this, it works, things work. But it's slow and it's boring, but people have to do it. And you have to rely on the fact that if you do your bit there, other people will do other things because they see other people do other things. This is why I, I speak all the time about you're on show constantly because society pulls itself in ways depending on what people are doing, good and bad. So I always think you can't fix everything. You have to go in my bubble. Yes. I'm going to do this. Yes. And like you wouldn't have never met me. You wouldn't have known that that meant something to me. And I always rely on the fact of if you have to just live your life and do the things and hopefully there's enough people there that somebody will see stuff that you'll never meet and they'll do little things and then they'll Yes, do those ripples undoubtedly so, yeah. so think equal. Um, mm. Can I actually, just finishing off, when you finished the documentary, where we, I mean, I don't, I kept thinking about you. How did you get through that? What, when mm. it's done, done. Did you sort of have to decompress and, after a bit or? No. Basically, what happened was I did have a mini breakdown yeah. while I was. I was going to say how you even got through it. Yeah, I got through it because I had an extraordinary thirteen-year-old yeah. who got the phone me call. It. The phone call of I'm going to come home <laughs> to do to the child. You know about that? Yes, I'm, I'm yes, just get yes. you an arbitrarily. Yes, yeah, which friends, <laughs> I can't do this anymore because I was thinking, That's right. how could you sit there? I thought I don't want to go. Into, what were you thinking going through it to get through it all? Mm. Let alone the film, like watching it. To God knows how many minutes that takes to get all that footage. But yeah, you phone your daughter. I had eighty-seven hours. Half of it was in Hindi, and oh, right. all of it needed. All the Hindi needed to be transcribed right. because how could I cut it yeah. without understanding right. every word? Yeah. So I worked first on a paper cut from the transcripts to bring the eighty-seven hours down to about forty. And then we subtitled 40 hours of yeah. material so that I could then start telescoping it downwards with my editor. Yeah. We sat for a year and a half yeah, together yeah, yeah. Um, and, and finally brought it down to one hour. Um, so I had this mini breakdown, which, which actually was, it lasted a night. I mean, it couldn't last any longer because yeah. I had a lot of work to do. So I had to get over it. But my daughter helped me get over it yeah. by literally saying to me, you are not coming home. <laughs> You're not coming home. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, me and my generation of girls are relying on you. Yeah, there you go. Oh. And that just sobered me up immediately. Yeah. The panic attack I yeah. was in the throes of just ended like that. Yeah. And I just thought, oh, my God, if she can be so wise, how can I be weak and, you know, uh, and unwise? So I'm just going to take that advice. Yeah. Um, and I did literally take her advice and start solving the little problems first. That's what she told me I had to do. Write a list and start with the little problems. Yeah. Um, and I got very through. wise advice. Actually. Very wise, yes, right? Yeah. Um, so I got through the filming, then I got through the editing. Then I came home on the 14th of July 2014 to finish the post-production here in London, discovered on the day I arrived that my husband had just been um, diagnosed with a terminal illness, which, thank God, he's still alive and we're controlling. But it was all pretty intense, right? Mm. Well, 
I still had to get this film out and had to get it finished. And and I'd had all the insights in my brain and heart by then. So I knew that what followed this film was no more films, but this education yeah. that I had to create from scratch because right. it didn't exist. Um, and so I just kept going. Then in March 2015... 8th of March was when the film was going to be seen in seven countries all at the same time in a symbolic gesture that these countries were holding hands and saying, we all own violence against women and violation of the human rights of women and girls. And the film got banned the week of its um, uh, uh, transmission. It was to be transmitted on Sunday the 8th and on the Tuesday just before that, the film got banned. A magistrate said this film is has been designed to cause public affray. And they came to arrest me. And I was in Delhi at the time because I was there cutting the Indian version of the film. There were a few changes we had to make. You can't name a rape victim in India. It's against the law. So there were certain little snips I had to make. And I was at NDTV doing that when I was told that there's a warrant out for my arrest and I'd better leave. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't actually, I didn't jump ship. I waited because 24 hours after I was told this and they came to the house I was living in to find me, um, I, uh, I had a flight book to come back to London where I was going to do press just before the Sunday. So I thought if I can just sit it out for one more day, um, then I can't be accused of evading justice. Right. And I was scared. I didn't know what the extradition laws were. I knew that uh, Indian law is based on British law because of the colonial yeah. history of it and all of that. So I was just scared that I would then fall foul of, of the law and I just stayed put. But what I did was thought, where am I safest? In front of a television camera. So I went to NDTV, the extraordinary channel, Pranoy Roy and Radhika Roy, that amazing family who run this extraordinary channel. And I said, I need to be in front of the news camera on panels all day long so that if they come and arrest me, they have to do it here in yeah. a studio on camera. And I sat there speaking to Prime Minister Modi into the lens, you know, saying, don't do this. You're crazy to ban this film, <laughs> you know. You have asked, you have a campaign going called Betty Bachao, Betty Parao, which means save the girl child effectively, right? This film says everything you say. Right. You're making a big mistake, Prime Minister Modi, I said into the <laughs> lens, right? And at six o'clock, I was spirited away to the airport <laughs> and I made it onto the flight. And while I was flying back to London... I discovered that my my assistant, Riddy, was with me and her phone was working. Do not ask me how that phone was working while we were flying. But she got a message from her brother saying, India's daughter's being shown right now. They had pulled it forward because I think the BBC were terrified yeah. that David Cameron and Modi would <clears throat> get together, have a conversation, and Cameron would be persuaded to ban yeah. the film in England. So they just went out with it four days early and out it went. And I wasn't even in London oh. for that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so ways. so part, part of the, your, your sanity would have been the fact of proactively deciding straight away, right, things have to change. You just jump straight to being proactive towards. Yeah, because I'd had all the insights yeah. in those prison cells. So now I thought, yeah. what is the point of making films? Yeah. I can't keep making films. Oh, yeah. I know the truth now. You've seen it. So I've no seen it. Yet. I can't unsee it. Yeah. I've heard it. I can't unhear it. Yeah. I now have to spend the rest of my life yeah. on bringing this missing piece of the education system yeah. into being. Now, of course, I wasn't an educationalist. So what I did was I went and hounded the top brains in the world. I stalked them. I heard that Ken Robinson was up north giving a, a, a talk what he does. He's the greatest educationalist who ever walked the earth, sadly died nearly two years ago now. But he spent the last three and a half years of his life, big chunks of time, helping me create this, this um, education dimension, subject. Um, and it's a brilliant program. It's miraculous. 
It is now in 30 countries. In four of these countries, we've achieved what I set out to achieve, which is a system change in education. Because in these four countries, the ministers of education have mandated this program, not just the subject yeah. generally, but this program with its direct, tangible, concrete tools yeah. put in the hands of the teachers to lay pro-social neuro pathways in the developing brains of our children. Any child who learns this program for even one year, and we have three years worth of it, even one year will be changed into pro-social, loving, empathetic, kind yeah. human beings, critical thinkers for the rest yeah. of their lives. It's that thing that you have to come to the realization that things don't change from the top down. They just don't. It has to it, be somebody lonely, bored, broke at the bottom who changes mm -hmm. things. You aren't going to see the fruits of everything. That's the only way it changes, the grassroots yes. from the bottom up. Um, so did it go to straight to Think Equal? Was there any, Was that the first time? Think it, Equal. Okay. I mean, we called it something else yeah, initially, some ghastly and name. What, that was... what is it? <laughs> okay, it's a program and a movement. Yeah. So firstly, on the basis of a movement, it advocates for policy change. And as I say, in four of my th our 30 countries, um, we have changed the system of education in that their three to six-year-old children are now learning numeracy, literacy, and think equal. Oh, wow. That's Every that's, yeah. child across each of these four countries, without a single exception. Imagine what's going to happen. Which countries are they? Gambia. Yeah. I'll be in the Gambia, yeah. Uh, North Macedonia. Yeah. Belize and El Salvador. Uh -huh. El Salvador is about to start, hasn't quite yeah. started yet, but the other three are in the throes of it. Yeah. Belize has uh, all three levels, Gambia all three levels, and we started it off with, I found a funder, in the case of Belize, an extraordinary woman called Jen Gross, who has funded every child in the country to get this program on one level. UNICEF then saw it and said, oh my God, we'll fund another two levels. Yeah, yeah. A uh, very similar thing has happened in Gambia, where, again, I got one human being, extraordinary man, called David Suddens. I mean, without these people, I could do nothing. So I really shout these names out, right? Um, he funded every child in the Gambia to get the program. World Bank is now funding another two levels. So, you know, that's how it goes. Yeah. Goodness spreads. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, are you ready for the big optimism yet or yeah. not? Let me tell you. Go on. Go for it. The UK. Now, the UK was my worst country. Yeah. I got nowhere bashing my brains against the yeah. brick wall of the education ministry here. I was so angry. Yeah. I'm still very angry with them. This government simply is not listening, does not listen. I finally managed to get through to one man, <laughs> one person, one person yeah. <laughs> who is responsible for education policy in this country, or rather sits on the select committee for education policy, who said to me, look, we have one problem in this country. Really? That's marvelous. <laughs> that's quite a positive that, that, outlook. That's, you've yeah, got that. well, that's yeah. great, yeah. Our one problem is children post-pandemic aren't attending school. We have 20% of kids who are you know, staying back at home and the parents are homeschooling them and we have no idea what the parents are teaching them. Hopefully something better than you're teaching them, actually. That's your problem? Excuse me, open your eyes. Anyway, I've been so angry with them, I can't, well, you can hear. Yeah. I tell my team, no more, not one ounce of effort more is going to be spent on England, the UK. Actually, because... All of the UK at that point, I was not managing to yeah. get to. Scotland was appalling me, I have to tell you, because the teachers there who I, I went to and pleaded with directly to audiences of teachers were basically saying, well, yeah, we think this is a great program, but we can't teach it. And I go, what? You can't teach it? Why? Yeah. They said, because we have a policy of child-led free play. I thought, what jargon is this? So what? Child-led free play. I said, how can education not be child-led? 
any education is child-led, and so is this. Free play. Well, we have play in this. We have role play. We have... They said, no, no, you're missing the point. It's not... Free play is not directed play. You're teaching them things that's directed. I said, well, all teaching Te has to be directed. Is what are you talking about? Obviously, they said, yeah. no, no, here's the thing. In these early years, we are only allowed to teach <clears throat> children what they show an interest in, what they come to us and say, I want to learn about this. I took the longest Pinteresque pause you've ever come across, started gathering all of my books, and my, oh, books no. and my things, maybe a minute of pause. Hmm. I looked at that audience and I just said, well, I'm leaving Scotland now and I'll probably not return because I've never come across a three-year-old interested in gender equality. Have you? And I walked out of that hall. I thought never to return. But wait for this. Wait for the optimism. I then, it's a longish story. Do you want it? Yeah, do you want course, it long or course, do you want it short? I'm just okay. hoping it's a movie esque sort of you've given up and then the phone rings <laughs> at like four in the morning or something. Nearly that. <laughs> Nearly that. So the next thing is, I have given up on the UK and I've told, yeah. issued an instruction. We're not spending one ounce of energy any longer. We will go with the countries who are asking for this and who know they need it and who are enlightened enough to care about their children, not neglect them the way this government's been doing. Okay, so the next thing is, a mayor in Monterrey, Mexico, reaches out to us and says, I've had three or four teachers come to my education team at my mayoral office saying they're doing this program, Think Equal, and they're seeing miraculous transformations, this is the words he used, in their children within four months, five months. So I need you to present this program to my team. I do. And he then decides he's funding every single child in the second biggest city in Mexico. And I think, wait a minute. A mayor, this is the first mayor, by the way, who's ever said, I have the funding, I can do it. So I think there has to be one enlightened mayor in the UK. Yeah. Oh, my God, I thought, of course there is. Andy Burnham. <laughs> okay, right? yes, yeah. Greater Manchester. So I go to him. Listen, within four weeks of Andy Burnham hearing about this, his education team is saying, we are going to give this to our teachers across Greater Manchester. Now, they didn't think more than maybe 20% would take it up because, you know, teachers are overwhelmed. They have programs thrown in them all the time. And they said, and of course, in England... We can't mandate. We don't mandate anything. It's up to the teachers. I said, no, no, no problem. Just offer it. Just offer it. Well, they offered it. 82% of teachers took it up because there's such a gap and such a need. Yeah. Okay? And then there's a problem. <laughs> How do we fund it? It was many more than they initially thought they had the money for and the money they initially had the Combined Authority of Greater Manchester, amazing people, the most enlightened, visionary, committed, dedicated human beings, right? They had money from their school readiness budget, but they didn't have enough for all those teachers across all 10 districts of Greater Manchester. 42,000 children are now learning Think Equal across all of Greater Manchester. Who's paying? Not the Education Ministry, of course. <laughs> Why would they? Why would, why they, why would, would the education they? minister fund education? Exactly. Yeah. It's the National Health Service mental health in education teams and the violence reduction unit of the police. Yeah. Now, therein yeah. lies the optimism yeah. because they know, they understand the relationship yeah. between building pro-social human beings, yeah. right? co-constructing with these children neuro pathways yeah. that love not hate back to that mandela quote yeah if you can teach children to hate you can teach them to love yeah can i tell you i shouldn't I, I, there's things that have happened i've been a little psychologist for a while i don't know why my brain was broken and it's on that's what i'm on and i always thought can i say these things because people are going to hear these things and know what i was doing so i would just experiment with people all the time and my brain was in like psych psychology mode and um, I was trying, I was fixing myself at the time, but mm. things I'd used to fix myself, I used to just experiment on people to see 
is it really that simple? Now, then I, I didn't know if I'd say this, but what... what uh, Honesty is important. So no, let's all be honest. It's not, there's say. nothing bad, but I just yeah. don't like... It wasn't like I was... So I noticed like when I worked in nightclubs doing security, mm. no matter what you said to the young ones come in, didn't matter. They weren't at an age to hear certain things. Don't do this. Don't do that. They, I realized Too late. it's yeah you they, they weren't not going sick. to nightclubs before they were sex right yeah but too late <laughs> but and I thought it, it, stop telling him to stop thumping that's what you do when you're that age and you're doing that that's what you do you can't you might as well tell him to not want to eat you don't do that if you've been taught before the age of six not yeah. to do that but I I then started to realize because I come from a bad background I thought they're not bad people of course they're I not. couldn't I used to tell people I know burglars that I would live in a flat with that were scared, timid, kind people of that would give you money of if course. I had nothing. They'd split a pound with me, literally, but have to go and break in because their dole money got cut because they didn't fill out a form properly. Mm-hmm. And they would go quiet for two days because they had no money, realising they'd have to go out and break mm. in. They're not monsters. No. Anyway, so... And I, they're disenfranchised and they think, well, nobody cares about me anyway, they had, so I they may hadn't. as well just do what yeah. I need to do to survive. And they were good people and they were burglars. Two of the rapists were sensitive human beings. I promise you that. Christ. So uh, there was one time this stuck with me. I so saw I'd have a young guy. I realised in gangs, there was people that were in gangs and would come out. They ran periphery of it and I'd work with them. But they were really kind. Like I remember talking to somebody about like philosophy once and I realised, oh, nobody's ever talked to them about this. I know. And one of them would brought me a book and he'd been to the library. And I thought, God, he has never been to the library. Anyway, something happened once. And it was just one of the many things that I experimented with and didn't work. And this, I remember thinking that they're, they're quite protective over our friends, but even though they've had nobody to protect them. And people are in the gangs and they seem to be have high protective instincts over other people because they haven't got it. And I just noticed it. Yes. And I tried something once where there was a young guy and... Um, there was a fight going on and he was just another young guy that wanted to, he was in cage fighting and all this sort of stuff. And I just tried something because I realized a lot of these people have no identity, but they've latched on to the identity of a gang because there's, no, there's nothing else. Yeah, absolutely. It's what family. gives them the self-esteem yeah. they and are lacking. Because they're protecting people, meanwhile yes. not seeming like a bad person. And it didn't make sense. And there was one incident and it shocked me. There was a fight going on and I saw this guy um, talk to somebody a little bit and he was young, about 19, 20, he talked to somebody. And I just thought, I'm going to try something. It's one person. And um, anyway, so I, I realized that people, they, these were, they're empty vessels. They're looking for things. They could be part of a Nazi group or a church group. Mm. They're just, they've got nothing. They're hollow, even at 18. And I said to one, that, as I put it in my head, I was going to say it. The next day they turned up. And this guy turned up. Let's call him Kevin. His name wasn't Kevin. Kevin turned up. And I said to him in front of other people, I said, oh, here's the negotiator. I said, what do you mean? I said, oh, like uh, I saw him talking to those guys the other day and he calmed it down a little bit. And then everyone started calling him the negotiator. That night, he, he started talking to people rather than I realized he was playing there a you role. There you go. And it scared me. Mm. I was he literally started to play into the role that I'd given yes, him based yes. on something small he did. From then on, so that I actually you that valued night, him for something. That night, I made myself like if there was a bit of trouble, I thought I'm not going in there with him. I said I would send the negotiator in, and he would go, and he was playing a role of talking to people. It scares me as I even say it now that his personality changed that night mm. because he was giving a label about being a talker when he was the opposite. And he went into that role. And then people that he knew, the people that he dated, became different slightly. He wasn't around those other people because he was self, he, he has a sort of self esteem. So might be a bit of po- a positive, you know, affirmation. Yeah, but or I, you know, on I mean? one you're, night, you're, you're reaffir- you know, you're... it changed. Mm. And it scared me that that's how easy it is for me just going, let me just try and call him that. Let, he, he did a little good thing there and he started to play into that role and he became mature by 10 years within a week. Hmm. And people then around him were different. And he liked being around older people because I realized, oh, he, he doesn't want to be like that. He's now got a bit of self- Nobody, nobody who, yeah. uh, you know, disregards, disrespects human yeah. 
life really wants to be yeah. like that. Uh, it's the hard way to be. But if you've got nothing, yeah. I remember saying to people... I always think it's the sign of an unhappy person. If, you, if you're very uh, you're negative and grumpy, I mean, yeah. you know, grumpy or aggressive even, I just think, I do feel sorry for people. I mean, I'm at the point now where... Luckily, luckily, I'm very arrogant and have lots of over bringing with conf- self confidence, unearned self confidence. Don't get yeah. me wrong, but uh, <laughs> but when people are mean, when people are mean to me or rude to me, I just think, oh god, I thought, well, oh, I said, isn't that? Well, I think, think about you, what they've you know? endured. Think of what yeah. they've come from. There's something called aces, adverse childhood experiences. I mean, this is a whole movement of itself. You know, acknowledging and understanding that I found something accidentally again. I had a weird feeling inside me for years. And I come from a bad background, but anyway, I, I, and I had a weird feeling. I was thinking, it's like I'm, I feel not, I feel tired and a little bit sick and a bit. And I thought, is it depression? It's not depression because I'm naturally positive. And I remember where I was. I was sitting in front of a computer and I realized that um, I was thinking about a fight I'd had. And I got a little bit of a happy adrenaline inside me because I was working in nightclubs. That's all I'd done. Mm. And maturity just kicked in at a certain age and I suddenly saw everything. Mm. And I realized I can't remember anybody hugging me in the last four or five years at all. No physical affection, nothing. Partly myself, you know, because you become a different person. You don't become that person. And I thought, oh, when I'm having fights, I can feel people's hands on me. And I think I'm taking pleasure from it because there's nothing else. I remember sitting at the, I remember where I was. And I remember thinking, wow, nobody's hugged me for a while. And I thought, I mean, I can't think, I think, that was the last person I remember hugging. And it was only my friend of mine, he died. He used to force me to hug him because we were doorman and he was a lot older. And he said, give me a, he said, give me a hug or I'm going to give you a kiss. So you better hug me. And then of course he died. And then I realized, oh, now I miss. That physical it was like hugging, content. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and, content. He, and he grabbed me and pulled me in. And I hated it. And I did hate it at the time. And then I missed it. And then mm. he died. And then you go, oh, now I know. So then I started, when I would hug people, it would, I would stand out to me. Don't tell them how well they hug people. I met them the first time and I go, wow, that's, they hugged me really well. And it stayed with me from five, six years ago. Yeah. But the replacement of not being hugged and then suddenly realized, oh, that's why, because I'm not a fighter. I hate fighting. So what, but it's that or nothing. So I'll take that for, so that just translated into everything. And then the guy, the negotiator, was saying him because he had nothing. He had no his parents, didn't care. He's just fighting. But it was a, it's if there's nothing, then you grab at anything, whether it's a fascist group or oh, I suddenly believe in that or a good thing or you know somebody yeah. good, positive that comes along. That there and a lot of them got addictive personalities anyway. But if they're on the wrong path, but most of it is they're not introduced to anything. They're living one-dimensional lives. Yes, and, and there's a bad. natural searching for meaning. Yeah, you know? and that's what it is. They and just belonging. want to be valued as a human being. But yeah. if there's nothing there, there's, something will come along and fill that pot up with something. And then you go, oh, look at them. You go, well, where was the rest of society for the when they years needed beforehand. when the gap was yeah, don't so start blaming him now yeah this is how people end up in yeah. all types of uh, appalling situations yeah. and yeah. hanging out with all types of weird yeah. and, and unsavory so, types so, so yeah. thinking what are the sort of basics of it what is it you take okay, them at a young so, age yes you take them at a young age and you um give them the programmatic tools that are going to um nurture them into these positive behaviors. They're going to help them deal with their big, unpleasant feelings. We never say bad feelings. There's no such thing as a bad feeling, you know. Anger, absolutely fine. Everybody feels it. Um, It's a natural emotion, as is sadness. But if you feel a lot of anger, then it's very unpleasant. Uh, And we teach them whether feelings are high energy or low energy, um, very pleasant or very unpleasant. And they learn how to control, how to live with this. Why is suicide the number one killer of our young boys under 40? Why? Why of our young boys, not of our young girls? Because we're bringing our young boys up to not feel. We're basically saying, don't cry like a girl. Man up. Feelings are weak, aren't they? Don't be you. <laughs> Don't be you. Strong, silent type. Don't Gary express Cooper. yourself. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Don't be scared. Don't be sad. Don't dare shed a tear. Yeah. Um, be angry. Yes, that's manly. So we are putting our children, our, our boys, into these 
emotional straitjackets. When I say we teach our children in Think Equal gender equality, we teach our boys to be healthy for their sake, not just from the point of view of boys versus girls, as to girls. Um, we give books, one book every week, and these are age appropriate on three levels. So our three to four year olds get different books from our four to five and our five to six. And then we have a fourth level of the program, which is for emergencies and conflicts, which is now in Ukraine. We're in 28 languages, by the way. Um, we give the children a book a week. We obviously train the teachers in how to use these materials. Every book is then unpacked over three lessons that week. And the lesson plans, step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step guides to the teachers of what to ask the children, what to point out, what to discuss with the children. In a Think Equal classroom, you see three- and four-year-olds debating, discussing. They get so involved in ideas. They're at the height of their powers at the age of three. Their synaptic connections in their brain are firing at the rate of one million synaptic connections per second. It's not even think about, I can't even encompass that yeah. in my brain. But this is a neuroscientific fact. <clears throat> so here are these children with the teachers taking them through these lesson plans for half an hour, 45 minutes, three times a week. The repetition, they have the resources that go with these. So these are the three elements, the resources, the lesson plan booklet, and that book of the week. We teach them mindfulness. We teach them to focus on the inside, on the outside. We teach them to share, to love. You have never seen anything as beautiful as a Think Equal classroom where the children are looking after each other. Yeah. I, I'm so inspired every time I go in. I've just come back from South Africa recently, two weeks ago, in Kailicha Township, such a poverty-stricken, violent place where children in primary school are joining gangs. And I'm there actually filming this classroom for a video we're making for Think Equal of some of our global programs. And the teacher's speaking, and the kids are telling me why they like Think Equal. What is it about Think Equal? And the kids are saying things like, I love to love with my heart. I, you know, they're so into it. The parents, two parents came um, because I asked, can you try and find, you know, a mother or a father, ideally, but probably a mother, you know, who will just tell us, have they noticed any changes at home? And the teacher said, we, we had such a hard time telling parents, we can't have too many of you, sorry. And we brought you two. I hope that's okay, not one, <laughs> because, uh, you know, one of the mothers said to me, my child has saved my family. She's talking about a four-year-old girl. She said she has saved my family because I was in a deep depression, going through a divorce with my husband. She came home and taught me how to breathe, how to breathe through my depression. She came home and told me about this mood meter, which is a, one of the tools we have from Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, this, this mood meter where I could go from the blue, where I was in very, very deep depression, into the green. And she taught me how to do it. She saved my family. Another mother tells me her little girl, again, these were both stories of girls, but we've had so many stories of boys too. A mother um, who said her little girl, who had no voice, again, a four-year-old, same class, no voice. She said, she's always been the quietest, sweetest child, never would kind of speak up. She has two brothers. They're both older. They do the talking for her, the mother said. She comes home a few weeks into this program, and I'm in a bad mood that day. And she says to me, Mommy, you must speak to me with patience. <laughs> you mustn't shout at me. It's not kind. She said, I was completely and utterly stunned. And it's the first time I actually heard my daughter's voice. This is what is yeah. happening in these classrooms. How did you come up with everything? Was it? Did you just spend some time looking around at educational things and pulling the best bits out? Or I did that. Yeah. I did a lot of research. So straight off, the minute I had finished my duty to the film, the documentary, yeah. because, of course, 
I did take very seriously yeah. that I would go on the road. And, you know, for, for the first six months after the film was shown, I was off, you know, being interviewed by the news and the this and the that. And I did all that because uh, I took, as I say, my responsibility there seriously. But while I was doing that, I was researching furiously. We want to teach children to love. At what age can we do that? How do we do that? Has this been tried before? Are there any evaluations? There are 60 plus years worth of longitudinal studies that prove that if you teach children in their early years, while their brains and their personalities are being developed to be kind and to be positive, this lasts well into adulthood. There's even a 60-year study now, right? And 25 years and 40 years. Nobel laureates, Columbia University, NYU, the most extraordinary studies. And we pretend that we're data-driven. How many times have you heard that? Oh, we're data-driven. I mean, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll consider this possibly in the UK, but do you have any studies that prove that, well, we have one from Australia. Will that do? No, 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 no. We have to have it from right here in the... Oh, piss off, really? Really? I mean, can't you extrapolate? Have you got no imagination? Um, do you really think that kids in England are different from kids in Australia? What an idiot are you? You know, and go to those shelves. Go to those studies that are gathering dust. You say you're interested in data. The data's there. Look at it. They don't even know this stuff exists. Yeah. And all they can do is delay things by saying, show me another. Do you know how much an RCT, a randomized control test, costs? We've done three. Mm. In Botswana, Colombia, and Australia, identical results. Do we really need to keep doing them in every country? Do you know how much they cost? Around $200,000. Very bloody hell. <laughs> I would rather use that money yeah. to give children think equal. Yeah. Let me tell you an astounding <clears throat> statistic. It costs exactly the same amount of money to give Think Equal, with all of its materials, everything needed, everything needed, to 48,000 children here in the UK. These are, this is a UK costing. Exactly the same amount of money, 48,000 children, to prevent violence in them and build them beautifully, as it costs to incarcerate and pay the prison costs of one violent offender for one year. Now, you tell me what kind of idiots are sitting in the treasury. Do they have a calculator? Yeah. It's the thing of the, the, the will isn't there, even though the logic's there. If, if it's, well, I'm not going to be around in 10 years, so why would yes. I spend the money sort yes. of thing? So We're going to lose the next election anyway, yeah. so why should we bother? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Let's only look at the next two, yeah. three years. because the next we voting look at, cycle. I that. mean, really, this yeah. is neglect of the highest order. This is a disgrace. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the thing. You sort of have to realize that not going to help you from the top. I've got to do this now for the next 20, 30, 40 years. That's and it. And eventually they'll go, oh, right, yeah, okay, because of now enough people have said something. We've got yes. to start planting those trees yeah. whose, whose shade yeah. we will never know. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Mm. And look, look at Greater Manchester. Do you know what's yeah. happened since? The Glasgow Violence Reduction Unit of their police is now wanting to give this to every teacher in Glasgow. Mm. This amazing man, Jimmy Paul... His name should be screamed from rooftops, as should Scott Kennedy, who works with him, who have convened the teachers of Glasgow. We've started there now. You know, Hounslow, Ealing, Tower Hamlets, uh, um, Plymouth, uh, Devon. I know they should be together, but <laughs> actually they're, yeah. they're separate in terms of the, yeah. um, uh, the education authorities. Hertfordshire, the Wirral. It's spreading like wildfire now. Who, and who, oh. and must say, Wales, who were there at the same time as Greater Manchester, they were forerunners in this, leaders in this. No coincidence, perhaps. And I mean, Think Equal is not political. I have to tell you now, we will work with any government any time. Um, but it's perhaps no coincidence that um, the Labour Party yeah. is figuring very large in who's making the decisions to actually, yeah. you know, Glasgow. Um, uh, Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham. Yeah, um, are you hoping that now that when we get the Labour Wales. government in, that something will open up? Yes, I believe it will. Okay. I mean, it's no coincidence that Labour started this uh, programme called Sure Start, 
Um, I think that was its name. And it was a wonderful program, then got shut down. I'm not quite sure why. I mean, it wasn't quite Think Equal, um, but it was, you know, of the same ethos. Yeah. It didn't have the tools. Look, what is unique about Think Equal? What is unique is that here you have a program that is doing what Article 29 of the Convention of the Rights of the Child, which has been ratified by every single nation state on earth, asks us to do. Article 29 says education should be directed to the whole personality of the child. And of course it should. Who else is going to teach our children how to be kind, mm -hmm. how to be peaceful? You know, one of the 25 competencies and skills we teach is peaceful conflict resolution. This is a skill. Yeah. You have to be taught it. You can't just hope. And then, of course, you have genocides and wars. I mean, all of these marches, yes, good, good that you mark your passion for it, but get out there and do something yeah. about this. Well, you think, if you're saying words like genocide and wars, the people that start those were once killed three-year-old kids. hundred <laughs> percent. And if they thing, had had Think Equal, people. <laughs> there would be no wars. I mean, honestly, it yeah. stands to reason. It is so logical. It is so obvious, yeah. you know? Um, so, so it's going in the right direction. That's oh, all. Yes. It, the cogs are moving. That's Big the time. main thing. The cogs are moving and another little cog gets added and another little cog. And they're cog. moving fast. Yeah. I mean, look, this is six and a half years since our first pilot programs. 30 countries, that's pretty good going. Just six years? Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Wow. Oh, yeah. And listen, we've just been funded by the British yeah. um, Foreign Aid to bring the program to 58% of children in Zimbabwe. Yeah. We are in whole cities around the world. We're in whole provinces. Well, maybe when we do, there's another little um, ray of hope in this country that maybe once the Conservatives have gone next year, somebody might with more sort of rationality might, even though it's politics, might, something might crack open. I met a guy, I can't say anything, but I was in the houses of, where was I, Lords? Or what was the one? I was House of Lords. House yeah. of Lords. I met with somebody and um, we're talking about doing business and training people and taking people from rehabilitation that's nothing to do with words on paper. Yes. Other stuff. Because some people, I, from myself, realised I couldn't learn via words. I had to right. do, listen and see stuff happening. And he said... um. Yeah, I didn't say anything. He said, um, he said, that politicians, he said, they don't care about anything. Mm -hmm. This is in that where I was mm -hmm. sat. He said, um, he said, what they care about is looking good and does it save money? That's it. He said, don't come mm -hmm. to them with anything else about well-meaning. But you'd think that they would look at how this is going to save money. Why Why are the police well, that's what I'm saying. and the mental health units because, interested? Yeah. I, because he it's said, going to decimate. He said, find out. He said, it's crude, but he said, find out how much. Because I said, what I want to take is people that might go to prison. Find out how yeah. much that's going to cost and say, look, give us that money yes. to pay them as a job. Not give or them a, even a part of that money. Yeah, know? anything. Anything less. Give us that money. Yeah. We'll meet the thing. We'll train them and see if it works for them. And then, you know, it grows That's and grows. Right. But he said, um, yeah, he said, don't come to them with anything about the moral stuff. He said, forget it. He yeah, said, they, they get letters care. every day. He said, no of matter course, what, we'll, we'll get back cynical. to you. We'll get back. He yeah. said, just find out how much it's going to cost to not do your mm. thing yeah. and then get that on paper. And that's exactly, though, what yeah. we did with the 48,000, right? Because if we're even 0.01% successful, I yeah. think, you know, whatever, I, I haven't actually worked this stat out, but it's not going to be much, much more than that. Then, you know, we save someone from going to yeah. prison, well, he let said, alone what we will be, which he, is he said to me, hugely successful. You've already done it when yeah. you said about the police. He said, go to the top of the police who are struggling because they're at the end. That's right. The ones struggling. They're, they're not the politicians. They're the ones who go, no, we're dealing with not doing these mm. things. Mm. He said, go to the top of the prison service. Well, it's got a bit grey with private prisons now. But um, go to the top of the prison service. Go to the, Get somebody in that chain there that's near the top to go, look, get them on board to say, look, we need to do something. If you're not going to give us the money to help us here, then for God's sake, do something. So we, the next lot is going to mm. be slightly less. So yeah, maybe go. You have to go around the back way to certain things, and maybe, yeah. you, maybe your voice isn't takes. loud enough. But the police commissioner there is, the prison officer guard there is, other school system, somebody, and those people go around the back doors to go to them, the politicians. Okay, I'll take these people seriously. Then maybe, mm. um, 
But yeah, you won't get anywhere with the conservative if they're not listening to any common sense. Uh, they, they're sort of checked yeah, out that's... a bit, I feel now yeah. as well. Like the last. Well, at least there's a little the bit of light in the tunnel. No, they're gone. And yeah. by the way, all of this that I've been saying that has touched on parties yeah. and politics is my personal opinion. This has nothing yeah. to do with Think Equal. Yeah. I need to make that disclaimer. Well, it always comes back to you're thinking about children. You're not thinking about you. You're not thinking about no, government. You're thinking about what only works. about the children. Um, yeah. Right. So that's what everything is. So uh, optimistic can, though, right? Yes. yes. Change it. Yeah, Thank I'm you. glad. Thank you for that. I, I, I needed that, especially after I had a yeah. had a bit of a rough day yesterday with everything oh. going on. And um, yes, I needed that. So thank I, you. Um, much. I just want a couple of minutes on you. What do you do? What? How are you? What are you doing? What's going on? Are you reading books? Are you oh doing my God, no. no! I don't have any time. I was hoping you wouldn't say it because you sound like me. And it's what? What? What I'm do you watch? Cinema? Something? Film you've seen recently? Only news. Oh, Only no. news. I mean, really, I am as dull and boring as you can get on a personal level. I don't really see my friends anymore. Right, uh, occasional news. text here yeah. and there. I've just been traveling like for the last two months. And this I do a lot because, you know, this yeah. is global. I have to get to the countries. I've just done one long stint of New York, the UNGA meetings um, from there to Belize, Madagascar, South Africa, Berlin, Helsinki. Uh, now I'm home for about three weeks before I have to go to Mexico right. And New Orleans. What was, the, what was the last film you saw? As far back as it was. When... It was Oppenheimer oh, in right. New York. Oh, okay. Um, cinema, cinema. You went to cinema. Okay. Yes, yeah. I love, I, I still love cinema. But I mean, I see, I don't know, two films a year. It's it's ridiculous. It's yeah. pathetic. But I sit and work 18 hours a day. I'm not exaggerating. No answer. I work 18 hours a day, seven days a week. You've taken me away from work here today. This is what I think this it's is Sunday. part of the process. This is part of the, <laughs> it's all, it all adds in. For now, <laughs> the reflect somebody here. The something. chatting. Yes. It's, it's work light. I this think. is my social. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's, it's not, Thank you. You're not going to come away from work, but if it's work related and doesn't yeah. feel like then work, it's fine. Yeah, I can like, justify, you can justify speaking to, to two wonderful <laughs> human beings. I was just saying to him and yesterday, having fun. somebody I work, uh, uh, um, uh, rent a, a room with, he said, he said, I've, I've moved in three months ago. He said, I've never seen you not working. And I had to say to him, it's work ish. Workish. Yeah, exactly. I'm too lazy to work, work. So it has to be work, but with people I like. See, it's like so this show, I've always said this is because I've been saying about marketing. Like I said, it's a show for people I like to meet that we'll record and put online. But that's it, it has to be that first because well, I'm not wonderful. doing any work. I'm not yes. doing any work. But um, look, here's the thing we're in yeah. such a terrible state. Can, can I end with a beautiful yeah. quote yeah. Of course. from George Orwell? Oh, okay. One of my favorites. He nearly made it onto my finger. Was it George Orwell? What oh my quote? I might goodness, know it. my head's gone now. It's no, it wasn't George Orwell. <gasps> Look at that. I'm I'm overworked. Was it another O? Was it an awesome Wells? It was Wells another or something? George. No. Um H. G. Wells, thank oh, okay. you. Okay. Thank you. You <laughs> said it to me. Okay. H. G. Wells. Right, and yeah. Sir Ken Robinson told me this. Okay. Our founding patron, Sir Ken Robinson, oh. told me. H. G. Wells said, Civilization is a race. Between education and catastrophe. Yeah. Now that is so true. And we are as close to catastrophe as you can come. Yeah. Have you been reading? I have about the probability, not even possibility anymore, of human extinction. We have gone so far in this darkness of catastrophe, you know. We should be dealing with the climate now. Instead, yeah. we're dealing with wars and genocides. And yeah. what are we doing? Yeah. I mean, we have to stop this. There is only one way to move forward in this world. Yeah. And Gandhi said, last quote from me, if we want to create real peace in the world, those, how many were marching yesterday? 300, 500,000? Yep. If you want, genuinely want, and if you're for real, not just slogan shouting, if you want real peace in this world, if you want real justice in this world, Gandhi said, we shall have to start with the children. Yeah. And that is true. So come on, let's all pull together. Yeah. Let's focus on the children. Anybody listening to this knows children. They have children. They have friends or relatives who have children. They go to, to school. Just come together. Help us. Help Think Equal to bring this to every classroom, 
every child in every classroom in every country in the world. That's what we've got to do. And within a generation, we'll have done it. And on that note... Yeah. <laughs> Thank well, you. I, thank you so yes, much. Thank you yes. for coming in on a Sunday. As I said, it's it's not not work, but it's a bit workish, workish, <laughs> <laughs> work light. <laughs> Leslie, it's been a pleasure to yes. speaking to you. And uh, uh, anything we can do to help, of course, we're, is on a, you have an open door here. So um, thank, thank you very much. And as I said, now I I have to make sure I say things to people because of things I didn't say to people. So it's just from me to you, the documentary and what you did and everything that encompassed is part of me and part of why all the things I'm doing carried on literally in my head. I'm deeply so, honoured. I, I really am. Sure you, you, one person that, you know, you never would have met, that, but it meant something to me and it does every week. Amazing. Thank you very much, Leslie. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you everybody yes. else. Bye then. Here's your story. Let's begin. The world is fine. Come on, dive in. The future's here. It's right before you. Could be alive.